Hey, if you need a Bible tonight, we're in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Raise your hand. I, I forgot a part there, sorry. Uh, raise your hand if you need a Bible this evening. If you did not come with Bible in hand tonight, we want to make, make sure that uh, you can check the pastor. All right, so raise your hand if you need a Bible. Look at more hands just went up. Let's see how it is. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Ladies, uh, we've got great women's studies coming up this uh, winter, and uh, they all start this coming week, so make sure you're signed up. Please don't procrastinate. Um, and uh, we've made it super simple, so uh, you can go online, you can use the app. If you don't like any of those techn technological options, you can go to uh, the Connection Center, and uh, we'll do it for you. That's, that's the kind of people we are. Chapter 10. Okay, let's all stand together. <clears throat> Verse 1 says this, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, say it, can never. with these same sacrifices which they offer every, with, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Answer, Yes. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. God, we are so thankful tonight for the greatness of Jesus, your son. And we pray tonight that his supremacy, God, his greatness would not be lost on us, God, that we would glean more, that we would drink in more, that there'd be more space in our minds and our hearts to receive, God, that we'd be hungry for more. God, never satisfied with the knowledge that you've given to us, but pursuing you for not just more knowledge, but for deeper experience. God, a genuine, sincere, sincere real, true walk with you is what we want. And God, we want that all the way to the end, the very last day that we are here on this earth, however that day comes, God, we want to endure, and we see that solid, strong exhortation in these words tonight. So, um, Father God, I pray, do what you do best. God, move powerfully in this place, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated tonight. You know, it just, it did dawn on me that while I was reading uh, those verses, maybe you've not been with us on Sunday nights um, and maybe, it's, it's possible, maybe you're an absolutely brand new believer, um, and maybe you're not a Christian, and so when I'm reading these words, and at the end I'm talking about the blood of bulls and goats, you're thinking, man, what, what, where did I just come to? What is this all about? Because this just got a little weird here. And uh, you're thinking for the quickest escape. By the way, there's lots of doors, but uh, we'll all see you when you leave. And now, like if you get up, we know it was you, so don't, don't even do it. Um, but let me just give you a little bit of context really briefly because it's a, a long chapter uh, tonight. And the context is this. Uh, we're dealing with a group of Christians who are Jewish. Uh, they've put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Not a popular thing to do if you were a Jew living uh, in and around 64 AD. Uh, and so because of that, because because there was persecution and there was persecution, they began to be tempted they were living in a coastal community, probably somewhere in the country of uh, modern-day Italy, and, uh, and as they were suffering persecution, not necessarily physical yet, but definitely social and certainly economic, and uh, for sure cultural. There was cultural persecution in their lives, and because the heat was on and the opposition was real, they began to uh, think things through. Um, certainly not according to the Holy Spirit. They thought, hey, you know, things are difficult here. They probably would be simpler for us if we would just go back to Judaism, to the, the system that we used to believe in, where sacrifices were offered every day, where on the Day of Atonement, a sacrifice was made for the people, where there's a high priest and a, and a priesthood. And all of this, we know this epistle was written before 70 A.D., because in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, and all of those things came to an end. 
The whole system of sacrifices came to an end and, ha and has continued to be at an end uh, and will be so until the third temple is rebuilt. But even when the third temple is rebuilt and sacrifices are reinstituted, they will have no meaning in the eyes of God. We're going to see that here in just a minute. So, you know, this is what you have. You have, a, you have an individual inspired by God, concerned about a group of people who are, who are wayward. They're drifting, and, and as they're drifting, they're on their way to departing from their faith in Jesus Christ. And that is the thrust, thrust of this epistle. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to encourage you, maybe tonight, maybe tonight you're wayward. Maybe tonight you've been drifting. And you know, this is the, the danger of drifting. It's imperceptible. You don't really realize how far you've drifted until the moment comes where the Spirit of God awakens you and, and you realize just how far you are from God. That's why deception is called deception, because it's deceiving, okay? Sorry to be so rhetorical, but, but that is the reality. Um, the, the devil loves to put the blinders on people sometimes including the people of God, and whenever we depart from the word of God and truth and believe in a lie, what happens in our lives is deception. And you know, it's not until we have a moment, a spiritual epiphany, God gets a hold of our hearts, kind of like uh, the prodigal son, you know, who, who in his pride was demanding his inheritance early, and, and you know, the father allowed it to be the case, and he went off on his way, and and uh, spent all of his uh, money on licentious living, and then he had a moment. He had a moment of awakening. And, you know, the, moment, the Bible says he, he came to himself, or he came to his senses. And he said, he said, for goodness sakes, what am I doing here? If I was just a slave in the house of my father or a servant, my life would be better than this. And so there was that moment um, of turning in his life. And it's certainly the prayer of the author of this epistle was that this would be that for them. And, you know, he, he holds no punches. You're going to see this tonight. There's just this beautiful uh, marriage of strong exhortation. You know, this is, a, this is a book that has seven very strong specific warnings for wayward believers. When I say wayward, I'm talking about um, individuals who are on, the, on their way to departing from the faith. You know, very specifically, seven very strong warnings, but as you'll see tonight with those warnings also, there is uh, just loving encouragement at the same time. So tonight we're going to talk about how much greater the sacrifice of Christ was than all the sacrifices that were made in the temple. The Bible says in verse 1, chapter 10, let me reread, for the law, we're talking about the Mosaic law, uh, not just the Ten Commandments. Um, but the whole religious law found in uh, the Pentateuch, Genesis, all the way to Deuteronomy. For the law having a shadow of the things to come and not the very image of the things can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then... Would they not have ceased to be offered? So, so he's saying, look, remember, he's, he is providing a great contrast, right? He has been proving that Jesus is greater. You have Jesus on, on one, this is kind of like the uh, ultimate uh, UFC uh, title fight here. You've got UFC on one side, or you've got UFC, you've got Jesus on one. That's what happens when I get confused by my own illustrations. You've got Jesus on one side. Uh, and then you've got the, the whole of the Old Testament law on the other side. Now, these things are not in uh, contradiction to each other because, because God instituted both of the covenants. But he's been proving, you know, piece by piece. Let's talk about the worship of angels. Jesus is better than angels. Let's talk about the role of the, the earthly high priest from the line of Levi. Jesus is, is better than the high priest. Let's talk about the, the Mosaic law and the old covenant. Jesus is better than those. He has his own priesthood according to the order of Mel Melchizedek. And so, so Jesus is, is superior and his sacrifice is superior. In fact, he says here that the law was just a shadow. It was a shadow of the real thing, um, of, of, the, of the real substance, of the real truth that God ultimately was going to bring. In fact... As, this is one of the, 
benefits. There are many benefits of reading the Old Testament. Um, by the way, we're reading through the Bible in a year, and I would encourage you to join us in that um, in, um, on our app. You can check out uh, the reading plan on the app. And if you start now, you're not, you're not too late. You're not so far behind the curve that you can't catch up. But the whole, one of the benefits of reading the Old Testament is all of those things that God did in the Old Testament were foreshadows. They were looking forward to uh, the real thing, the superior thing that he was going to do through his son. This is why Le Leviticus is such an important book for you to read. All those sacrifices were not insignificant. They were, they were a shadow. They were a foreshadow of, of things to come. You know, when, when you're walking down the road with me and it's a sunny day, like 3 o'clock here in the city of Las Vegas, um, and, uh, and maybe you come up on us as we're walking and, and you see our shadow. You don't talk to our shadow. That would be really weird, by the way, if you did. <laughs> You don't talk to the shadow. You don't have a relationship with the shadow. You don't focus on the shadow uh, because the shadow is not the real thing. The real thing is a physical body that the light is casting um, itself on and creating the shadow. Uh, and so in a similar way, this is, this is what the author likens the law to. Um, and in addition to that, he proves his point by saying it was never the intention of God to perfect people by these Old Testament sacrifices. In fact, not only was it not God's intent, it was impossible for them um, to do that. If it was possible to be perfected, uh, to be cleansed of your sin, to have a cleansed conscience by the sacrifice of bulls and goats, then those, that sacrifice would have only needed to be made once. But they weren't made once. They were made morning and evening, and the Day of Atonement was every year. And the repetitive nature of these sacrifices, they were done continually, was a constant reminder that the sin ultimately, you know, atonement in the Old Testament is a covering. That's what the Hebrew word is, kofar. It means to cover. Atonement in the New Testament is to cleanse or to be released from. They're, they're two very different results from two completely different sacrifices. And so the repetitive nature of these sacrifices is a reminder that ultimately that sin is still with that person. And so he says in verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Now, if you're not a Christian here tonight, um, and, uh, and you're thinking, well, you know what? Uh, Jesus is just one God uh, among many gods. And why, why do you Christians um, speak so forcefully about how exclusive Christianity is? Almost like it's the only way to God, which it is. But, and I don't, I don't mean that, you know, uh, pridefully. I'm just telling you the truth. He said it himself. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Um, but the reason, the reason why Christianity is the exclusive way to God is because there is no other system that, that deals with the issue of sin in people's lives. There is no other system. Hey, how do you deal with your sins? When I wasn't a Christian and I was dealing with guilt and shame and all of that stuff, uh, the, the solution in my mind was, was drinking and drugs and illicit relationships uh, and worldly distractions, but I numbed myself. I would wake up, and I'd be riddled with guilt the next morning, and, and what I would do is I would try to numb myself to that guilt, and, and it was, the guilt was from sin. God had given me the light of conscience, which he has given to every individual, the things that I was doing, even though I would say it doesn't matter, uh, what's good for you is good for you, what's good for me is good for me, uh, morality is relative, deep down inside, I knew that wasn't true. And you know, deep down inside, you know that's not true either. And if it, if it was true, then you would never feel guilt or shame for things that you do. No, God's placed it within your heart because there is a moral law and there is a moral law giver. And no amount of alcohol is ever going to expunge the sin from your life. You can't cleanse yourself. This is my point tonight. You can't cleanse yourself. The only one who can cleanse the sin in the human heart is God. And, and he, he has provided a way for that sin to be cleansed through his son. We're going to talk about that 
um, here in just a minute. So, so you have the Old Testament sacrifices on the one hand. They were repetitive. They were uh, incapable of perfecting an individual. Um, and they were all, in any way, just uh, a foreshadowing, okay, kind of like a warm-up. Probably a bad way to put it, but you know what I'm talking about. A warm-up of the real thing to come that was going to deal with sin once and for all. That's the person of Christ. So verse 5 says this, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. So we have an Old Testament quote. And by the way, as you're reading the scriptures, you'll notice that the, uh, the way that these words are justified is different. They're in italics. This means it comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Um, this particular translation is from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And this is the son. So this is prophetically speaking. You guys with me tonight? Just nod your head, Okay. All right, thanks. This is the son, we're, we're speaking prophetically here about a thousand years before the actual incarnation of Christ. This is the son speaking to the father. So this is looking forward about a thousand years uh, to the point in time where Christ would give himself as a sacrifice. And even before that, ultimately the incarnation. So dealing with these two covenants, uh, one covenant which is built on the blood of bulls and goats, Another covenant which is built on uh, the body and the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is what he says. Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. So, so this system of sacrifices, ultimately, the, the son saying to the father, was never intended to fully satisfy you, but a body. Now we're talking incarnation, Isaiah 7, 14. Um, that this amazing thing would be done that God would cause a virgin to be with child, and that he would be called Emmanuel, that is God with us. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, just divinely placing the person of Christ in the virgin womb of Mary. You know, what an awesome thing God did, pres preserving the God nature of the Son. He says, but a body you have prepared for me, a physical body. Um, and of course, the, the physical, the real tangible physical body, by the way, total side note here, and I don't have uh, many of these that I can actually have tonight, so I'll try to keep them to a minimum. But this was also written during the time where Gnosticism was becoming very popular. And Gnosticism was a heretical perversion of Christianity. It was a combination of Christianity and Persian dualism. And Gnosticism taught that it was impossible for anything material to, to be good. And so with that thought in mind, they denied the actual physical incarnation of Jesus Christ. They denied it. So there was no physical body that hung on the cross. There was no physical body that rose again from the dead. This is why John deals with all of that so specifically in his first epistle. And certainly we know that that's not true because a body was required. A physical body was required. Blood had to be spilt. Real blood had to be spilt. And your blood was, was never, would never be, could never possibly be sufficient for the cleansing of your own sin. You can't atone for your sin. This is why the Father sent the Son, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And the Word became flesh, right? And the Word became flesh. But a body you prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me. The whole Old Testament canon of scripture is about Jesus the Messiah, all right? When you read the Old Testament, read with Christ in mind, discover him in the Old Testament. And this is what it says, to do your will, O God. The, the purpose of the Son was to do the will of the Father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, this was what he prayed as uh, he was dealing with the, the coming agony of the cup of God's wrath that was being mixed for him. He said this, nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. It was always the desire of the Son 
to fulfill the will of the Father. John 6, 38 says this, For I came down from heaven, this is Jesus speaking, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Somebody say amen. amen. John 4, 34 says, My food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Right? He's talking to this Samaritan woman, and the disciples are like, what are you doing talking to her? You know, a little amplification here. What are you doing talking to her? She's a woman, and she's a Samaritan. We just got some food. Time to grub down hummus and pita. That's not in the original text, but that is my addition. <laughs> and that is kind of like what was going on. And he says, I've got food to eat of which you do not know. There's something else that sustains me. To do the will of God sustains me. Hey, if it's good enough for the son, it should be good enough for you. Does doing the will of God sustain you? Is it your desire, the, the same desire of the Son? Can you say that you exist here not to do your will, but to do the will of God? As you look at your life, do you have this vision for your life? You are His poema, His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has beforehand prepared for you to walk in your whole life. Listen. Your whole life, not just for a season, but for your whole life. And so as you are looking at your whole life, do you have this intention to do that, to fulfill his will and to finish his work that he has set before you while you live on this earth? I hope the answer for you is yes. And so verse 8, he kind of gives his own uh, interpretation here. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor have pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. This is how it rolls in the Old Testament. Then he said, so there's the first half. Then the second half, then he said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God. So the author says, this is what God is saying in these verses. Check the end of verse 9 out. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. He takes away the first. So in this verse, as the son is speaking, the son is saying, listen, that system is over. And this new system has begun, okay? That system is over, and this new system has begun. You can't take the Old Testament system of sacrifices and the sacrifice of Christ and do them simultaneously. Because when, when the latter was instituted, the former passed away. Verse 10, by that will we have been sanctified. By that will, whose will? What will? What will are we talking about? Okay, the, will of, the will of the Son, to do your will, O God, the will of the Son. By that will, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That, by the way, is really good news. It's a great verse. Um, you should be somewhat excited about it. All right, that's good. We got one guy excited right here in the front. God bless you guys. Should we close now in prayer? It's 659. So you've been sanctified, set apart, set apart by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ who gave himself once and for all. Um, this is how super significant his sacrifice is, and we're going to talk about that now in verses 11 to 8. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. So he says, hey, think about the Old Testament, or think about the Old Covenant. Uh, think about what's happening right now if you were living back then. Think about what's happening right now in the temple. You have a, you have a priest who is standing there ministering every single day and offering sacrifices over and over. And those sacrifices ultimately cannot, impossible for them to take someone's sin and the ultimate punishment that they deserve, the conscious awareness of it, take all of that away. In contrast, verse 12, but this man, that's a great phrase, but this man, I think, I think he's overwhelmed. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm, think, I'm thinking he's thinking, but this man, he's awesome. Okay, he's awesome. I hope you feel that way about him. But this man, this one, not these guys, not this system, but this one who is the word, the eternal word of God, you know, how awesome would it have been to have walked with Christ, 
during those three and a half years of earthly ministry. You know, we long, we long for that type of experience. The reality is this, it's coming and even better, all right? You will walk with him. You will see him face to face. And, and you're gonna, look, you're going to have to get in line because I'm first. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. That was probably really bad to say. Totally self-centered, huh? Someone pray for me right now. You know, even the unbeliever, even the unbeliever got a piece of this. Even the unbeliever got a piece of this. Pilate, Pilate in John chapter 19, after Christ was scourged, right? The whole skin of his upper torso ripped off, flayed away. Veins and arteries pumping blood into the open air. His face beaten beyond recognition, probably still covered with the spit of men. Blood pier- his beard plucked from his face. It's coming. Plucked from his face. And this is, this is what Pilate says. He brings him up to the Jews. He's, he's, tried to like, he's tried to get him released because he knows, because his wife told him, have nothing to, should have listened to his wife, guys. Have not, I've had a dream about this man, have nothing to do with him. So he's like trying to like get, right? And at the end, this is what he says, I've washed my hands of him. You can't, no, no, it doesn't work like that. You can't just wash your hands of Jesus. But after he's scourged and just beaten beyond recognition, he says to the people, behold the man. Behold the man. Have you ever seen any man like this? Pilate saw something he'd never seen before. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, this is, this is huge, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, For sins. How many sins? All sins. You do, hey, you do the math, okay? I don't have time to do the math right now. But just today, uh, 8 billion people living on the face of planet Earth, everyone sinned at least once. Some of you I know, it's, we're talking exponential calculation here. But even, even if it's just one sin for every person on the face of the Earth, once today, we're talking about 8 billion, 8 billion offenses against God. Multiply that by 6,000 years, you know, calculating whatever the population would have been. We're talking about a mass of sins. You with me? But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Isn't that an awesome verse? So you got all these priests, and they're always busy, and there's always sacrifices to be made, and their work is never done, and they're probably mad about it, and really, I've got to do this again, not with Jesus. He did it. He said, tell us die. He said, it is finished. He rose again from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of God. He sat down. That's what he did. He sat down because it is done. That's how powerful and sufficient his sacrifice was. And you know what? Right now, he's just waiting in heaven until the Father sends him back and makes his enemies his footstool. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So he made one offering as opposed to uh, the millions of animals that were slaughtered and sacrifices sacrificed. He made one offering, and when you put your trust and faith in him, this is the way this author presents it. He presents it like Paul presents justification. He sees it as a done work. Okay? I don't even know if that's grammatically correct, but I don't really care right now. He sees it as a done work, a finished work. He sees it as complete. Okay? God is, God changes us. He's changing us day by day from glory to glory. Thank you, Lord. But he's saying, hey, he has perfected. It is done. When God looks at you, He sees the finished work. He sees already what he is going to do. The masterpiece, it is as if the masterpiece is already painted. Okay? You need to thank him for that right now. That's what you need to do. It's really good. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts And in their minds, I will write them. So remember, we talked about this last week. It's not written on stones, cold stones. It's written on hearts that have been warmed to him by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. 
Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So Jesus doesn't need to offer a sacrifice for your sins anymore because it was done, it was done with when he hung on the cross for you and for me. So, so at this point, the expectation that the author has is this. He's, he's fired him up. He's fired him up. He's turned the crank spiritually. There's an awareness. There's a like, you know what? This is a pretty good deal. Like, that's the thought that he expects them to have. That's the thought I ha expect you to have tonight, too. You know, that the crank has been turned. That there's, there's an awareness that's been given. Maybe, you know, maybe um, an appreciation that's been deepened in, in your heart for all that Christ has done. And with that always comes an application. You know, God doesn't want you and I just having a head full of knowledge. He wants that knowledge to sink deeply down within our hearts and affect the way that we live, all right? There is always application. You know, you can come and you can listen to, to teachings and you can be a, a, a student of different pastors and teachers on the internet, but if it never materializes into application in your life, it is worse than, it is, it is worse than valueless, and let me tell you, tell you why it's worse than valueless, because, because God's going to hold you accountable. God's going to hold you accountable to what you have learned. Like, you sit here and listen, to whom much is given, much is required. This is on all of us, me more than any of you. This is why James says, let not many of you be teachers. There's a stricter judgment. And you're like, ha ha, told you, pastor. Okay, I got it. I got it. But there's got to be application in our life. So check this out, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, this is what we have. You go straight into the place that was reserved for one man from one tribe for one time out of the year. You have access, verse 20. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So it's not a curtain hanging uh, in the temple separating the holy place from the most holy place that you go behind that was torn from top to bottom by God and the new way into the presence of God is through the, the sacrifice, the, the physical sacrifice of, of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God. So Jesus Christ is our high priest. He is the mediator between us and God um, and he is over the house. He is over the whole house. Senior pastor is not the mediator between God and man. Somebody praise God for that, just for a second. <laughs> neither, is, neither is the pope, uh, neither are priests. You know, there is no uh, person who lives here on this earth vicariously uh, as a vicarious representation of, of Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between man and God, that's a man, Christ Jesus. So he says, in light of this, here we go, application, let us, statement number one, let us... Let us draw, hey, can, I, can, do you, can you say amen to what we've talked about so far? Yeah. Okay, so let us, I did it on purpose, let us, so we say so be it, absolutely, I believe it, I'm for it. Let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is application number one, don't forget your destination. Your destination is to draw near to God, Okay. That's your destination. That's your target. That is your goal. He says you've been drifting. You've been departing. Uh, you, you've had mixed targets as far as your destination. One minute is Jesus. The next minute, um, it's, it's the temple and the temple sacrifices and angel worship. And, and I would encourage you tonight, maybe for you, you've, you've had this shifting target as a Christian. You're kind of all over the map. And you know, because you're all over the map, you're, you're really hitting nothing. One minute is Jesus, the next minute is it's your ambitions and your dreams and desires. Um, the next minute maybe it's the things of this world and sin that used to have a hold of your life. And, and you know, you're just shifting from one target to the next. If you really are thankful for all that Jesus Christ has done, set your target on him and draw near to him. Pursue, dig in, draw near with full assurance of faith. If you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, be confident that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And he's washed you and sprinkled you. Second application, second let us statement. Great thing to highlight, underline here as you're studying the scripture. Let us hold fast. <clears throat> let us hold fast the confession of our hope 
without, without what? Well, without wavering, for he who promised, what is he? He's faithful. Application number two. Number one is destination. Number two is determination. Number two is determination. Hold fast. Uh, don't let go of this confession of faith. For them, it was the issue of apostasy. But hold it fast without wavering. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Even if no one goes with me, I'm not turning back. Christ before me, the world behind me. Don't waver in what God has called you to. Um, the word wavering uh, means to be moved. So the exhortation here is to be unmoved by anything that comes your way as you're assaulted by the enemy. The enemy, by the way, is the devil, Satan. He's the adversary of your soul. And the minute you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you are taken out of his kingdom and you are transferred into the kingdom of Christ. And you became, you became his enemy. Before that, you were an enemy of God. And now you're an enemy of the devil. And the devil wants to undermine your faith. He wants to shake you up. He wants your, your spiritual knees to be wobbly. He wants you to be distracted from what God has for you. And the exhortation here is this. Because God is faithful, be unwavering in your confession of faith. And then the third application here is be interdependent. Uh, verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting, not extorting, exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, so application number three is interdependence. Interdependence. What do I mean by that? I mean, you need each other. We need each other. You need the body of Christ, and the body of Christ needs you. He says, don't forsake it. Don't avoid it. The, the, the whole point, don't avoid gathering together. You know, some people, I, I love technology, but you know, it's a blessing and a curse all at the same time because people think they can just have virtual church. You know, you get burned, you get hurt, uh, you don't like it, doesn't meet your needs, and so you're like, you know, I'm just going to do the church thing at home, you know, while I'm in my pajamas eating waffles, and, and you know, there's no selfishness in that, right? I mean... But you insulate yourself. You insulate yourself. And you think, you know, I don't, I don't need that. Well, guess what? Yeah, you do. Okay? And no, it's not perfect. And it won't be perfect this side of heaven because we're all sinners. But love covers a multitude of sin. And when we gather together, the purpose is that, that love is stirred up and good works are stirred up. So, so in your squad, you probably have a squad here in the church, your little crew Whoever your crew is, all right? Is that what's going down in your crew? Is that what goes down in your squad? Like there's a lot of love being, and I mean this in the biblical, godly sense. There's a lot of love being stirred up. There are a lot of good works being stirred up. You guys are provoking each other to good works. You know, sometimes in the squad, there's uh, squabbling and division and undermining. If that happens in your squad, listen very carefully, gossip, division, if that is happening in your squad, that's a squad you don't want to be a part of, okay? And, and you need to stand up and draw a line in the sand and say, hey, enough is enough. The purpose of the people of God being together, even in this small group, is to stir up love, not controversy and division, and to provoke each other to good works because this honors and glorifies God. You know, there are all sorts of people who have justified not being a part of the gathering of the people of God. And the reality is this, there is no excuse that will be justifi justifiable in the eyes of the Lord. We need each other, and he's called us to be together. So, so he gives application here, and then he, this is heavy, he gives maybe one of the heaviest exhortations, uh, certainly in the book of Hebrews, but one of the most in the whole New Testament. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. So, you know, some people have, have misinterpreted this, uh, and as they're reading it, they forget the context. They, they, they read it like this, for if we sin willfully, that means one small minor sin 
If after I put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ, I have one small minor sin in my life, um, then, there's, then there's no sacrifice that can cleanse me or forgive me. I have to live a perfect moral life after I put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, my salvation may be at risk. That, we know, is not what the author is saying. Absolutely, totally impossible. Because even John says... If anyone says that they're without sin, they're a liar, and the truth is not, not in them. And he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from any unrighteousness. And he says, if any of you sins, you have an advocate with the Father, even the Son, Jesus Christ. And so what specifically is he talking about? Remember, in context, um, the issue of sin here is departing from the faith. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about struggling with a moral issue. We're talking about changing the target of faith from Jesus Christ to the Old Testament system. This was what they were in danger of. And the author is saying this. There is no... Pro two, two positions on this. Saying either, number one, this is my perspective. I think there's more than this, but I think these are the most possible. Number one, there's no promise of salvation outside of a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So he's saying to them, if you step away from this, this is how it goes. If you step away from your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, how are your sins going to be forgiven? You can't go back to an Old Testament system that is obsolete by the very will of God. Those things can't cleanse your sin, so you expose yourself. You expose yourself, number one, possibly, he's saying, to eternal judgment. Um, or he is saying all of that to these believers, and, and the consequence is not necessarily eternal judgment because it's, you know, even though the wording seems to imply that it's not absolutely declared, he is saying if you as a believer turn away from having your target of faith, target of faith on Christ, God is going to deal with you, man. And he is going to deal with you heavy, okay? You know, it is a reminder that our God is not a God to be trifled with. It's imp important for us in a, in a Christian culture that desires to be so familiar uh, with God, which is a good thing because we're the friends of God. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, we reduce God so much to our level that we forget how holy and just and perfect he is and what a privilege it is for us to be able to draw into his presence. Sometimes we lose that sense of fear, you know, that sense of who God really is and that one day when the veil is taken away and we are in the physical presence of God, we're not going to be giving him a, what's up, dog? What's up, man? A little chest bump. Always wanted to, you know... I mean, it's not the way it's going to roll. It's going to be like John who walked with Christ for 60 years and fell on his face as a dead man when he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. So, so he goes on. Strong warning here, okay, and he's trying to get their attention. Anyone who's rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will, be, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. He's saying, hey, you guys need to be really careful. You, you better think this through. And don't forget, if God meted out judgment on his people for those who rejected the law in the Old Testament, how, this is the argument from lesser to greater, how much more? How much more? Well, you know, it's grace. Wait a minute. Don't you dare use God's grace as a license to do things that you know are wrong in the eyes of God. Don't do it. He says, of how much worse punishment do you suppose? And then he describes, um, I believe, the Christian who has changed the target from faith in Christ to something else. What do they do? They trample the Son of God under, underfoot. They count the blood of the covenant like something that's just common, insignificant, doesn't really matter that much to me, um, doesn't really mean that much, and insults the spirit of grace, the spirit of God who'd been working in that life over the course of time um, as, as, a, as a work of grace, because God's work in our life is a work of grace. We don't owe, we don't, he doesn't owe it to us. 
We've not earned it. God has been knocking on the door of our heart just because he is good. Verse 30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, you know, it's, when I was growing up, my dad, you know, my dad loved his kids. He had five kids. He has five kids. And, uh, you know, my dad loves, loves us, but let me tell you something, man. When my dad was mad, no. Like, run for your life, okay? And, uh, and I, was, I was the youngest of five, and so, like, I escaped a, a lot of, um, I escaped a, a lot of, uh, uh, judgment's probably too strong, but, um, but corporeal punishment, man, I escaped because I was just a little guy, and I just run for my life, you know? Um, but, but I remember times when we'd be on vacation, and, you know, five kids in the back of an AMC Hornet, by the way, my dad had really, <laughs> love you, Dad, if you're listening, he had really, sometimes the cars he picked were, were not all that good. This was a lemon for sure. But when the kids were all crazy in the back, all I remember is this hand, you know, the hand of Dad coming into the back. And I was a little guy, so I was, I was like, able to crunch up in the corner, man, and I, I escaped. But let me tell you something. I'm thankful for that. I knew what was right, I knew what was wrong, and my dad was consistent, in, consistent and loving in his discipline of us, and I feared that. And the fear of that, it wasn't fear that, that wasn't rooted in love, but the fear of that kept me on the right course for some time, you know, until about sixth grade, um, <laughs> as, as, a, as a little guy. And fear is not a bad motivator, you guys. The fear of the Lord is not a bad motivator, because we know ultimately that at the root of God's desire to discipline those whom he loves is the love of God. So he exhorts him. Hey, tonight, I just want to say this. You've come tonight, you know, maybe you've been wayward, wandering in your relationship with God, and here you sit, and you know, you're not really sure why you came in the first place, or, or maybe, you know, uh, you had tasted of the goodness of God, and you've departed for some time, and now here you're back. This God loves us enough to speak the truth to us to get our attention, and to draw us back to himself. So he says a hard word, but then he also says an encouraging word. Notice this. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. So he says, listen, you guys. I, I, know, I know that you believe in Christ. And there's evidence. There's solid, strong evidence of the real work of God's Holy Spirit in you. And this is the evidence this author saw, verse 33. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations. So you suffered. You suffered greatly. And partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. So you suffered yourself for your faith, but then also you were willing to humble yourself and identify with those who were suffering as well. Verse 34. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven so we don't know who the individual who wrote this epistle was but in some sense <laughs> who thinks it's paul raise your hand oh. who thinks it's apollos raise your hand who thinks it's barnabas raise your hand who has no idea raise your hand okay. <laughs> who doesn't care tonight raise your hand no don't 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 raise your hand but in some sense, I'm wrapping up, so just hang tight. In some sense, this individual who was writing this was suffering greatly, probably a preeminent person in the church, was suffering greatly, and these Christians had come alongside and had identified themselves with him, and they had suffered. They had suffered economic persecution. Uh, their goods had been plundered because of their willingness to identify with this individual, which I think uh, all the more compelled him to want to see them not depart from Christ. Verse 35, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. He's coming back. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The last word I want to leave with you tonight is endurance. Is endurance. Christianity is more than just an experience. It's more than just some 
experience that you have at some point in time in your life. It's more than just uh, some emotional encounter that you have with a worship service or a worship set. Uh, Christianity is a, a lifelong relationship and commitment to the triune Godhead. That's what it is, okay? Our generation, right now, this generation, is learning less and less about endurance, is less and less faithful to relationships that matter, less and less faithfulness to marriages and to children uh, and to employers uh, and to employees because everything is discardable. Everything's discardable. It's not working for you. Try something else. How many people have sat in the seats in a church and have had some sort of experience and then they've become disillusioned? Something happened that they didn't like. And so what did they do? They went and they tried something new. That is not Christianity. And if that's what's happened to you, then you've not really experienced God through trust and faith in Jesus Christ. You put your faith in Christ, and the expectation of God is that that is going to continue all the way until you take your last breath here on the face of planet, planet Earth. Endurance. Uh, the word is hupamone. Say it with me. Hupamone. Sounds like uh, Italian ice cream, doesn't it? <laughs> and, I, I, and I wish it tasted as good, okay? Because, because we also translate that word patience. And uh, patience doesn't feel like hoopamone a lot of times. It feels like, like poopamone. No, I, 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 I shouldn't have said that. I should not have said it. I should not. I shouldn't. I should, I should, I'm so sorry. It's so bad. It's so bad. I couldn't help myself. I've had the flu and I'm just recovering. And that's my excuse. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Let's pray. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, shoot. <sighs> Father, we love you so much, God. You're just so good and... We have great joy in you, God. We have great joy in you, and you have great pleasure in us. And it's an amazing thing, God, that to even realize that you have great pleasure in your people. And, and God, you take great joy when we are together and considering you and worshiping you and just talking of your greatness. And we're so thankful tonight. This awesome thing that you've done through your son uh, God, we don't, we don't even know. The truth is, God, we've just got a, a drop in an, in an ocean of awesomeness. That's all we have. And God, this drop is amazing. What you've revealed to us is above and beyond what we could ever even imagine. And God, we've tasted, we've tasted of this, and it causes us to long for more. Oh God, I pray that you just grant this church a season of hungering and thirsting and pursuing and seeking and, and God, anointed teaching and Bible study and, um, and, and home groups and just everything, God, would be all about you, that the fire of heaven, the fire of the Spirit would fall, just fall. Hard upon us, God. Consume us. God, we're sinners. We struggle. We fall short. God, we hate that about ourselves. And tonight we remember that you are faithful, that the work is done. And God, we just ask tonight that you would burn the dross away, that you draw us to your son. Tonight, as her eyes are closed, as her heads are bowed, you know, maybe tonight you've come in, you're sitting here, and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. By that I mean you've not trusted personally in the sacrifice that he made for your sins. His death, his burial, his resurrection. You know, there is a path to God. There's a pathway to him. You can, 
You could, there is a God. He's the creator of the universe, and he loves you, and there's a way to get to him. And you can't work your way there. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't be religious enough to achieve it. God, God did it through his son. Jesus Christ paved the way. He paid the price. And tonight, maybe you've never believed that. You've never trusted in God's offering for your sins, his son. You've never confessed to God what he already knows and what you know. Deep down inside, you know you've sinned against the Lord. And you need the forgiveness of sins. You can't cleanse your own sin. You can't do it, and I can't do it. Tonight, if you know this is you, you need to take a step of faith. And you want to put your trust in Christ, and you want to be cleansed. You want to cleanse conscience. You want to know God. You want to dwell in the presence of the Almighty God who is the lover of your soul. You need God's power in your life to give you hope and peace, to revive you to break the bondage of sin and its eternal consequences. Tonight you need him. There's a longing in your life. There's something that's been missing, and I'm telling you, it's God, and you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied, and you'll never have everlasting life until you put your trust and faith in his son. Tonight, if you need to take this step of faith, I wanna pray for you right where you're sitting. Would you raise your hand tonight? God is tugging on your heart and you know you need to believe in Jesus Christ. Don't trifle with a holy, perfect, just God. Don't trifle with him. He loves you. He's made a way. But he's calling you tonight to make a decision. So tonight, if this is you and you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to raise your hand tonight. Just stretch your hand up high. Let me see who you are. Awesome. Thank you so much. So great. Anybody else? Over here on my right, in the back in the center. Over here on my left. Awesome. Anybody else? It's dark out there. I need you to raise your hand up high so I can see it. <clears throat> see your hand in the back in the center as well. Thank you so much. Most important decision of your life, most important moment in our gathering together. If there's anybody else, raise your hand tonight. Let me see who you are. Tonight, if you're a Christian and, you know, uh, you've been wavering, you've been wayward, look, your target has been all over the map. And honestly, tonight, it's not been Christ. It's not, it's not been him. You've been playing games, in a sense. You've been playing games with God. You know, you call yourself a Christian, but the very fact is this, even the non-believers around you would never guess it. They would never guess it. And if you think that this is what Christianity is all about, you will have another thing coming. God doesn't want games. God wants your whole heart. And you know what? You either think the cross of Christ is worthy of that or it's not. And tonight, if you don't think that it is, then this isn't for you. But if you do think it is, and you know a change needs to be made in your life, and, and you need to give God what he deserves 100%, you need to stop playing games with the Lord and calling yourself a Christian where, when there's such little fruit, you have a barren life. You need to get it right. Don't trifle with God. God has better things for you than this nonsense. And tonight, if this is you, I want you to raise your hand. God has spoken to you. And you know, it might be hard and heavy, but it's the truth. And you need to make a decision tonight. So if you're a Christian, you need to rededicate your life to Christ and give him all that he deserves. Tonight, I want you to raise your hand. Awesome. Thank you so much. It takes courage. You know that? It takes courage. And I respect that. Anybody else? Awesome. Over here on my left. Thank you as well for raising your hand. Back here on my right. It's good. You're never going to regret this. Set the target. And draw near to him. Anybody else? See your hand. Thank you so much in the back and the center. All right. You can put your hands down. God, we're thankful for these. We pray, Lord, God, you're doing a work tonight. And just as we were led in worship this evening, uh, God, we want your Holy Spirit to do a work now in these lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, um, for those of you who have raised your hands, I'm going to ask you guys, please, no movement in the chapel tonight. This is the most important part of 
our service. If you raise your hand tonight, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer, okay? And uh, you're either giving your life to Christ for the very first time, or as a Christian, you're recommitting your life to Jesus Christ. This prayer is a prayer of confession and repentance. It's a prayer of faith in the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what God has ordained in his word. And as you call on his name, God has promised to do a great thing in your life. Christ, when he called his disciples, he called all of them publicly. Tonight, if you raise your hand, I want to lead you in this prayer. I'm going to invite you to come publicly as well, to take a stand for Jesus Christ. He went to the cross for you. You can take a stand tonight for him. And I'm going to invite you to come publicly as well, to take that stand, to come forward here this evening, um, to be led in prayer and to experience the goodness of God in the fullest sense in your life. And so tonight, Tony's going to lead us in a song of worship. And if you raise your hand tonight, I want you to stand up right now. Come forward right here to the front step of the chapel tonight. You raise your hand. You can do this tonight. Come on forward right here. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If there's anybody else tonight, uh, God is tugging, God is stirring, God is knocking on the door of your heart. Look, you can keep the door closed if you want to, but why in the world? Why in the world would you want to do it? You have a God of love who wants to enter into your life and bring to you everything he made you for. That's what God wants to do. Tonight, whatever turmoil is holding you back in that seat, I'll tell you it's not worth it. And you will regret deeply not taking a step of faith tonight and responding to what God is doing in your life. Tonight, if, if God's tugging on your heart, you raised your hand, maybe you didn't. You need to stand tonight and come forward. Maybe you're nervous. Pastor, you know, standing in front of all these people, all these people love you, and they're praying for you, and they want you to stand right now. They'll, they'll be so happy. And grab the hand of the person next to you. Bring them down tonight. They'll come with you. Don't let anything hold you back. Pastor Tony is going to lead us for one more moment. If there's anybody else, we just want to wait, okay? We want you to experience what God has for you. So stand up right now if this is you, and come forward so I can lead you in prayer. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. And bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Christ. All right, we're so thankful for all that God is doing in your life. I'm going to lead you guys in a very simple prayer. Um, this prayer is a step forward in your faith, believing in Jesus Christ. God is going to hear this prayer. He responds immediately to it. He's going to do an awesome work beginning right now in your life. And uh, then right after we pray, Pastor John's going to be down here. We're just going to need a minute of your time because uh, we want to join you in this step of faith that you're taking tonight. Uh, and we want to walk with endurance with you. So let's bow our heads together this evening 
And I want you to make this your prayer to God. Repeat it out loud after me. Dear God, tonight I give you my life. God, I've sinned against you. I confess that tonight. But I believe in Jesus. He's your son. He is my savior. He died for me. And he has forgiven me of all of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to live a life worthy of the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Loves you guys so much. Hey, right over to my right, your left is Pastor John. If you guys can walk on over to him tonight, we just want to bless you this evening and uh, pray with you and give you a Bible. Let's all stand together tonight. If you need prayer, elders are down here in front. Uh, we're going to wrap up. It's been good and, and pleasant to dwell together, but we're going to wrap up with a worship song tonight. So even though it might be a little late, please hang around. Let's give God all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.